So now in this last video on homeostasis, we'll entitle the flowchart Animal Homeostasis 4. And what we want to look at here is now uh, a little bit more specifically uh, what it means in terms of the body systems and their overall influence on homeostasis. By this idea, what we're looking at is the following. There's going to be, in order to achieve homeostasis, key coordination and also key control. There are going to be key players that are involved in both. In other words, what I'm trying to emphasize is the fact that in order to achieve homeostasis, you need coordinators and controllers. You need, in other words, I'll put this in quotes, some sort of guide. You need guides to allow ever so complex body, body parts and body systems to allow complex body components we're talking like a nervous system and an endocrine system and an immune system and uh, you know a heart and lungs. All these things need to somehow, some way within our complex bodies be guided to allow this complex body components, uh, let me finish writing this, body components, to do what? To work together, to work so effortlessly and so beautifully together to give us the homeostatic balance that we achieve every single day. And Classic examples of this are going to be like the nervous system. The nervous system is going to involve your brain and spinal cord, your central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Those are very much coordinating and controlling components and guides that coordinate and control the body's complex components to work together. And another really important example, these two sort of work hand in hand. Don't think of them as separate systems. Think of them as one uh, that helps the other and vice versa. The endocrine system, which is what's going to be our next couple of lectures, uh, these are both going to be really important coordination and control guides. Think of them as guides that help homeostasis occur throughout the body so nicely and so smoothly uh, in those of us who are fortunate enough to be in that regard. Now, uh, I want to focus on endocrine regulation a little bit more, uh, so we'll entitle this next side of the flowchart endocrine regulation. So, like I said, what are some key words we keep on repeating when we talk about homeostasis? Balance, regulation, exchange, here's that regulation word. Endocrine regulation, and this is basically an introduction to the whole system. Uh, I'll break it down very, very simply. Uh, we have two whole lectures on this, but nonetheless, endocrine regulation will be a classic example of coordination and control to maintain steady state, to maintain homeostasis. How does endocrine regulation work? Endocrine regulation is going to be constant via hormonal feedbacks. So you know how we had uh, those negative and positive feedbacks? You can actually put them into a context of hormones. Hormonal feedback, more hormone, more hormone, less hormone, depending on the situation, whatever it may be. These complex feedbacks are going to actually be really important guides that uh, allow for the body components to work together like I mentioned before. But this is actually the first time we're mentioning this word, uh, besides in plants. Uh, in us, what are hormones? What are they in general? I like to think of hormones as just messages, okay? Hormones are specifically going to be really good. Think of them as long distance, Long distance, they can travel all the way from the brain to, let's say, uh, a muscle within your foot. That's a really long distance. So a long distance chemical signal slash message. Okay? This is something that the, the system, the endocrine system, is trying to get across. It's trying to guide some sort of process, whatever it may be, uh, through this long distance chemical signal message medium. And that's what a hormone is going to do. And we have different ways that this feedback system will work. Uh, I think the best way to really understand any of this is to put it in the context of a hormonal example. Uh, and we alluded to it when we talked about how uh, homeostasis is usually in the internal environment. Think of blood glucose regulation. Let me correctly write a B here. Blood glucose regulation. This is something that is constantly occurring, okay? Constantly occurring within us. How is it occurring? Why is it occurring? Well, first of all, blood glucose is really critical in maintaining homeostasis. We'll get into the details as we move forward with the course, but just know that in order to maintain homeostasis, you need to maintain a certain set point, a certain blood glucose level. And in order to do that, it's actually going to be occurring uh, via two, what are known as antagonistic, 
Okay, antagonistic. Uh, antagonistic. I want to make sure I write that. Okay, two antagonistic hormones. So this is going to be, in other words, antagonistic here just means two competing or contrasting or opposite hormones. And the, the correct anatomical term, the nice one, is antagonistic. Two antagonistic hormones, these are going to be the control mechanisms. These are going to be that part of what I said here. Remember how I said we need coordination and control? Who's controlling blood glucose regulation? Two antagonistic hormones. They do opposite things. What are the two hormones? Take, for example, insulin, something many of us may have heard of before, and also its antagonist, glucagon. Now, don't think of this as, you know, who's going to win, glucagon or, uh, or insulin. It's not like that. It's not a battle. What we're just saying is basically these two have contrasting and opposite functions that need to balance them out. They need to be balanced out in order to achieve that steady state of homeostasis in regard to blood glucose regulation. How are they antagonistic? How do they work in opposite? Uh, that's because insulin, to put it very simply, uh, is going to store and uptake glucose. What we mean by this is if a cell needs glucose, it will need to utilize insulin so that the cell can take in the glucose, uptake the glucose, and then store it if necessary, if there's extra, whatever it may be. So this basically means cells are using glucose, need glucose, use insulin to help them get it and store it and uptake it. Glucagon, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit different. Here what we're trying to do is release glucose. Instead of storing glucose and bringing it into the cell, what we actually want to do is release the glucose from wherever it's being stored uh, and put it all throughout the body. Uh, and that's the contrasting effect that we have here, the antagonistic effect. And this is simplified, but hopefully you see the opposite nature here. So what has to happen? What has to happen between both of these antagonistic controlling hormones is some sort of coordination. Some sort of coordination needs to be reached between them. And how do we reach this coordination? There's going to be a coordination between two anatomical structures. These are physiological hormones, right? These are antagonistic hormones. They're going to be coordinated between the pancreas, that's a, an actual organ that's going to be in charge of something, and also the liver. Both of these will be in coordination control of the insulin and glucagon that we're looking at. The pancreas specifically is involved in hormone production. So in order to get these control hormones, they have to be made. The pancreas will do that. That's the place at which we have the production of these hormones. So the pancreas does hormone production. The liver actually does storage. This is where glycogen, that's just the stored form of glucose, more specifically. That's what we call glycogen, stored form of glucose. Uh, gly glycogen storage occurs in the liver. So just think about it like this. What has to happen? Do we want to make insulin from the pancreas so that we store and uptake glucose? Or do we want to make glucagon, let's say? And do we want to make glucagon so that we can go to the liver, break down that glycogen into glucose, and release it to, uh, throughout the body? This is a classic example of an endocrine regulatory system. Again, two antagonistic hormones that are doing this. We'll get into the details of this process, insulin versus glucagon, and many other hormone examples uh, as we move forward through the endocrine system. But that concludes our look at homeostasis. I think, again, it's really important to appreciate the fact that this is an ongoing uh, ever so efficient process that's constantly happening, literally constantly happening within us so that we can lead the calm and hopefully happy lives that we have today. Uh, and that covers our look at homeostasis. We'll begin now our really in-depth look at anatomy and physiology with the endocrine system next.